Hello, I'm Julia Middleton, and I'll be lecturing today on trace metals in the oceans. I uh, am a fifth year graduate student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and I am doing my PhD work at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Uh, so I'm a chemical oceanographer, and I study trace metals in the oceans and what they can tell us about ocean cycling uh, and carbon export. But today we'll be focusing on how humans affect trace metals and also how trace metals are really important to the fisheries that are integral to the economies of so many places. Now getting into the slides, as I said, we'll be talking about trace metal cycling in the ocean. Uh, and one of the big questions people ask if they're not familiar with trace metals is why bother studying these things? And so these are just some of the reasons that we do study trace metals and they include they're essential for marine life, they can be toxic, and so those are sort of two sides of the same coin. Um, how much do we want for marine life to be able to live, but also how much is too much that ends up killing marine life. Some of them can reveal how humans are impacting the ocean. Some trace elements can be used to understand important processes in the ocean, like large-scale cycling. Some trace metals might influence climate change. And finally, there are those scientists, including myself, who use trace metals uh, to study geological history of the ocean. So to study uh, what the planet and what the oceans look like in the ancient past. Now today, that's too much to be going over, so we'll be focusing on two of these points, which I view as two of the real core points here, and that's how trace metals are essential for life, and also how trace elements can reveal anthropogenic impacts. Starting off with that, how do they help life question. Uh, trace metals are actually essential building blocks for life, and so what that means is all organisms need these trace metals to live and to survive. First, we'll look at some elements that are not trace elements, including nitrate, phosphate, and dissolved inorganic carbon, which I'll call DIC. Uh, and we're looking at the profiles here in the Atlantic Ocean in those pink dots, and then the Pacific Ocean in the blue dots. And as you can see, these elements are really low in the surface where the creatures are eating up uh, these essential building blocks. They need all three of these elements to grow um, and to live. And cells are very much, cells and DNA are composed of these elements. Um, and so with these three elements, all life is growing. And these elements are fundamental to that process. And then when those organisms die and start sinking through the water column, uh, they begin to break down, which we call remineralization. And what that means is rather than having nitrate and phosphate and DIC being building blocks in a little creature, it goes back into the ocean and those dissolved elements, which is what these profiles are, become available again. And that's why we see these concentration increases with depth. And so here, if we're thinking about the, the food web, in the very bottom left here, the uh, little green creatures, which I guess are on the left and the right, those little creatures are these little plants that are using those, those building blocks from the dissolved phase. So they can take up nitrate, they can take up phosphate and DIC and convert those chemicals that are natural in the oceans into biomass, which are these cells. And that uh, primary production, which is growing all these little plants, is the basis of all life in the oceans. And so we can see here all the way up to the tuna, which I'm sure some of you have eaten, or mackerel or squid, these creatures rely on those building blocks that are at first formed by these plants and then are eaten up through the food web until we have these fisheries that we care so much about. Uh, and like I was just saying, we can see, again, that's just nitrate, phosphate, and DIC, and they're being taken up by that lowest level of a food web. These uh, autotrophs is what it's called when they can use these fundamental building blocks. And then that is, goes up through the food web all the way up to the biggest creatures that we know. However, interestingly, you'd think, okay, if we have those three building blocks, if we have nitrate, phosphate, and DIC, anything can grow, everything will be happy. Certainly it will grow if all of those things are available. There are building blocks after all. Interestingly, that's not the case. We don't see that. And so what we're looking at here in the top graph is just nitrate to phosphate uh, because there's a certain amount of each that these creatures like, and it's around 16. Uh, so 16 nitrate to one phosphate is how much they like to eat at a time. I don't know about you, but I'm the same way. I like to have 
uh, you know, some amount of meat to some amount of veggies when I'm eating my meals. If it's too much of one or too much of the other, it can be a little boring. And then in the bottom, what we're looking at is chlorophyll A. And this is just a pigment that tells us essentially how much of these autotrophs, how much of these little critters that are at the very bottom of the food web are there. And so what we're really looking at here that is so striking is that there are regions, which I've circled here in red, which have the right amount of nitrate, the right amount of phosphate, but we don't see that much primary productivity. We don't see that, ma that many autotrophs or these little plants that are growing. Even though all these nutrients, these building blocks that we've been talking about are there. And so for a long time in chemical oceanography, there was this open question um, as to these regions, which are called high nutrient, low, chl low chlorophyll regions. Sometimes you'll hear that called HNLC. Um, and there's a real question, you know, the food is there, why are these creatures not growing? Uh, why don't we see primer pro primary productivity? And this is really what gets us into trace elements and in particular trace metals. Uh, here, this is just the periodic table, which I'm sure you've seen in other forms. The way that it is shown here, it is just with the profiles, so what the, each element looks like in the oceans. And the elements we're really interested in here are the ones I've outlined in red. And those are some of the most important trace metals in the ocean. In there we have nickel, copper, zinc, uh, and some, some would argue most importantly, iron. Iron is a trace metal of real interest to a lot of chemical oceanographers. Um, but for a long time, you know, I'm saying iron's important, but for a really long time, we didn't know that. Uh, Carl Turkian, who is one of the grandfathers of marine trace metal chemistry, he did a lot of the fundamental work uh, beginning to look at these things. And he said this quote, which is, indeed, one has the feeling that the whole field of trace metal marine geochemistry would have been completely dull over the past 50 years if it weren't for analytical errors. And so what he's saying there is that at the time that he was studying trace metals, it looked like nothing was happening. It looked like the distributions of these metals were completely random and that these little plants and these animals were not using them. They weren't important for life in the oceans at all. And so the, the distribution in the oceans, what these metals looked like in the oceans was completely random. And so he's saying, you know, it's not that interesting. However, in the 1980s, we began to understand that this random character that I'm talking about was actually because we as scientists were not sampling these things correctly. So we would go out, this is a ship uh, from my home institution from Woods Hole, and this is the Atlantis, which is our large global class vessel. So this ship goes out into the world's oceans all over the place. Um, and I was actually out on the sister ship of the Atlantis, the Thomas Thompson, which is owned by the University of Washington, Washington sampling trace metals in the Indian Ocean uh, in January of this year before uh, we all got uh, locked down, unfortunately, by the coronavirus. But what we know now, the way I sampled metals on my research expedition is very different from the way Carl Turkian was sampling metals. And this is because we began to understand that if you go out on a ship that is made fully of metal and you are sampling with sampling equipment, that you know maybe has metal springs, excuse me, maybe has your sampling water into metal drums. These things matter. And if you are sampling too close to a large metal ship, which is letting off uh, trace metals into the water around it, when uh, diesel and ship fuel is burned, it releases aerosols that have trace metals. And these things were contaminating the samples. And so as it turns out, what these researchers, including Carl Turkey, were actually measuring was not the metals in the oceans. It was the metals that we as humans brought in and were polluting our own samples with. Um, and you can see here, this is a paper from that time period. And they say some of the samples were taken in a galvanized steel barrel, which is a metal barrel. Um, and therefore those samples were most certainly contaminated. Some of the things that I'm talking about include the marine paint that you use on ships to protect them has copper and lead and tin, which are all trace metals in the ocean. There's not that much of them. And so if you have a ship painted with marine bottom paint that has these things, it will contaminate your sample. Similarly, the way that ships pump bilge water, the way they let off exhaust, these things will let metals into the oceans around you. 
And then, then I was saying uh, the old sampling techniques were not so good for measuring these things accurately. And so this led to a real uh, renaissance in trace metals, very much uh, led by a researcher named uh, Dr. Edward Boyle, who is a professor at, uh, at MIT. And he began to say, what if we sampled these things differently? What if we were more careful about sampling further away from the ship, about sampling with things that don't have metals touching our, our water, our samples that we want to measure? And so he invented uh, this, this device, which is called a toad fish. And I won't talk through all of these, uh, but if you Google them uh, or look online, all the sampling techniques that I'm about to talk about have really good documentation. Um, and so it sort of evolved from this toad fish Later on, you know, this looks quite simple. It's literally just a pole reaching far away from the ship. Um, but there is, we now know that if you sample about 30 feet away from a ship, so about 10 meters, then you are not in danger as much of contaminating your samples from the metal of the ship. And so even just sticking a plastic bottle out on a pole makes a big difference and be able to measure these things accurately. Uh, similarly, this is a type of sampler that uh, you can see in the bottom right figure that 250 mil polypropylene bulb is what they call it, is the sampling bottle that is getting clean water. Uh, this is a similar picture of a, a newer device that's doing the same thing. And this little uh, plastic fin you see off the back just keeps it oriented such that the sample goes into the bottle before the water ever passes anything metal. And so it's avoiding contamination from all these metal parts uh, that we can see in the middle there. Now these days, the what, what we as chemical oceanographers who are looking at trace metals use is something called the GoFlow carousel, um, which is currently the gold standard for sampling techniques. And basically what this is, is a large plastic uh, holder, that hold, which you can see in white there, that holds all these gray bottles. And these gray bottles are coated with Teflon, which is not a metal, it's a type of plastic. It's polyfluor, uh, type of polyfluorinated plastic. And has very little trace metals. And so this is a way that we can sample and we can say there is no trace metal contamination in these samples. And so the numbers we're looking at really are what's in the ocean. And to understand anything, getting that kind of accurate number is really important. Once you have the water, of course, you still need to be very careful and you need to process these samples in a clean lab. That means a lab that has a specific setup to avoid metal contamination because just the buildings we're in, the dust, there may be metal surfaces, these things are also prevent a uh, threat to your samples in terms of metal contamination. Now, all of this is somewhat of a long-winded way of saying, once we were able to measure iron and other trace metals more accurately, it turns out those high nutrient, low chlorophyll zones we were seeing, those zones exist because of what the trace metals are doing. These trace metals are so important to life that even if there is a lot of good food around, a lot of nitrate, a lot of phosphate, a lot of DIC, if there's no iron, these creatures cannot grow. Um, and we'll talk about why that is the case in a second. And so what we can see here is from the geotraces study. Um, and you can see in those regions where we saw very high nutrients, but no chlorophyll, there is very little iron. And so like I was saying, there's all this food that these creatures want to eat, but iron is like the fork and they can't eat with their hands. And so there's no way for them to get these nutrients and actually use them and actually grow. Now we're gonna quickly talk about why iron is so important. Why do they need iron to grow? What we're looking at here is uh, the intracellular mechanism for photosynthesis. And so what that just means is we all know plants need light and water to grow. Uh, this is the mechanism that allows them to get energy from light. And in order to get energy from light, it turns out they need iron. Uh, this photo system one that I've just circled here must have iron to, in order to generate energy from light. And therefore, if there's no iron, these things can't grow. Now, these are just some examples of other trace metals that, that things need to grow. Um, so it's not just iron that they need. Uh, these are proteins that we can see there's a cadmium protein that without that trace metal, cells cannot take up DIC. Um, and there is a, a nickel protein that helps protect a cell from damage. Um, and then there's another iron, another iron cell 
uh, protein, excuse me, that allows cells that can convert uh, nitrogen from the air into a form that they can actually eat because they can't eat uh, just nitrogen gas. Now, that is really interesting for the fisheries. Basically, what we've learned is these trace metals are critical for the fisheries. Um, and one thing I would like to point out here is that, uh, as I was saying right at the beginning of this talk, um, you know, there are trace metals that are essential for life, as we've just gone through. However, if there was way too much iron in the oceans, uh, that second bullet point, some trace metals are toxic to marine life. Um, if there was way too much cadmium, for example, cadmium is quite toxic at high levels. And so this brings us into more of this anthropogenic impacts. Uh, if humans are putting these trace metals into the oceans, we'll talk about human health in this example I'll be using, but they also impact marine health. And that's something that's really important to keep an eye on and be aware of as we have industrialization of the world. So here I'll be talking about leaded gasoline, um, which I, uh, I know is a very well-known example. So some of you may have heard this before, uh, but it gives a really clear picture of both how humans can pollute the ocean with these metals um, but also how we as humans really have the ability and the power to fix our own mistakes and to recognize, recognize pollution and then implement policy and create change that uh, mediates that pollution and helps protect the planet from this damage that we had accidentally caused. And so here what we're looking at is the rise of industrialization and the advent of leaded gasoline. Uh, they used to put lead in gasoline because it helped stable the stabilize the gasoline, which was good for the oil companies um, and made the gas uh, more energy efficient, essentially. But it turned out at quite a high cost, at a cost that was not worth it. Um, and so we can see there in these this graph here, uh, basically just production, which is like a proxy for industrialization, sort of related to how much gas we're using and how that's really increasing as the world's population increases. We burn gasoline, or you maybe know it as petrol, uh, by cars, by industry, uh, especially fuel burning by industrial activity is a huge contributor, contributor to this. Uh, here you can see um, just a little, I've circled the factory so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, and so this is that, I was saying it stabilizes the gasoline, this tetraethyl lead is what I was talking about. It increases engine efficiency when you do have lead in gasoline and increases vehicle performance. However, we began to notice, okay, we've put lead into these gasolines that we're burning all over the world for industrialization. And we're starting to see that lead in the surface oceans. Um, you can see in this map here with these stars, um, those are the four charts we can see below. And we can see, especially in the Western North Atlantic, because the, uh, uh, the industrialization of those areas was going a little faster, we see a lot of lead in the surface oceans. So these big increases that we see here, these are from humans accidentally putting lead into the oceans uh, when we were burning this leaded gasoline. And as it turns out, we didn't know at the time but it turns out it, this leaded gasoline and the lead in the oceans is incredibly toxic, both to ocean creatures and to humans. And the way that we've noticed this is because there began to be humans with symptoms of lead poisoning, which include brain swelling, uh, pulmonary, pulmonary edema, which means you have a rupture in your lungs and can't breathe properly, hallucinations, comas, and even death. Um, and so we started to see these negative health impacts in the world and realized that it was because we were burning this leaded gasoline that was getting not only into water sources that humans were drinking, but also into the global oceans. And this really led to one of the most uh, remarkable comings together of the world's governments that many governments recognized we need to not have leaded gasoline anymore. It's poisoning the earth, it's poisoning people. Uh, this needs to be banned, it needs to be phased out. And so what we're looking at here is just a graph of or sorry, a figure of generally when each region uh, began to ban leaded gasoline. And as you can see, uh, by 2002, pretty much the entire world had banned leaded gasoline because the health effects on the ocean and the human population were so severe. And so really this was a coming together of world leaders to say, we recognize 
that this is not good for the planet and we agree that we should all take actions to prevent uh, prevent leaded continuing to go into the Earth system. Now what we're looking at is what happened to lead in the surface oceans, to this metal lead uh, in the surface oceans after these bands. And so we can look at it this way. Time is going from right to left here, which is a little confusing. But we can see in 1979 where that dark red line is, it was really high. There were 160 picomoles per kilogram of lead, which is much, much more than normal. And then our most recent measurement uh, on this graph is from 2011, which is in purple on the left, and it's gone back down to the level you'd expect naturally in the ocean. There is some lead in the ocean, there's just not enough of it for it to be toxic. Um, and so we can see once the world decided we will no longer have leaded gasoline, we actually saw that the ocean recovered uh, when humans made the choice to protect it. And so this was a study that was looking at the US population and how lead was um, leaving the, the uh, bloodstreams of people, uh, which is kind of how you measure how, how poisoned you are by lead. And so this study found that during and after the leaded gasoline bans, the average blood level of US citizens dropped from 16 micrograms per deciliter in 1976 to only three micrograms per deciliter in 1991. And so we can see not only did the oceans recover as we were just looking at here, this study also tells us that the human health recovered. Uh, and that was very much because very strict regulations were put in place. Um, as I was saying, there are some other measures, uh, heavy metals that are toxic, mercury, arsenic, chromium, cadmium. These are ones that are quite toxic and can be very bad for human health um, and are also output during uh, industrial activities and our pollutants in that way. And so it's really important to monitor these and not accidentally get ourselves in a situation similar to lead where, you know, uh, there were really severe ocean and human health impacts, from, excuse me, from that gasoline. Uh, ultimately, trace metals are important components of life, but high levels are toxic, uh, as we just talked about. And um, we as humans do interact with trace metals. We do put metals into the oceans, uh, but in the best case scenarios, these, these inputs into the oceans are very much regulated. And so this is something that is ongoing work. You know, um, Shipping harbors, we know, put out a lot of metals into the oceans. And so monitoring that and having agencies that monitor that profession professionally uh, monitoring industrial activity, monitoring scientists like me going out into the ocean basins and measuring metals um, would be able to see if there's metals in the trace in the oceans that are more than there should be, more than normal. Um, and that is something that is really important to keep in mind when we are thinking about trace metals in the oceans, that they're so integral and so important to this life in the oceans, but also we as humans are impacting them. Um, and for me personally, it feels like a as someone who studies trace metals, it feels like a personal obligation to uh, think about how human activity changes those metals. Um, yes, and so I would like to really thank you for tuning in to listen to this lecture. I'm so glad that you could come despite uh, us being completely virtual this year. It's really exciting that people were still able to log on. And I encourage you to read more about trace metals in the oceans or if you're interested uh, to look into the current literature because these are still a very a hot topic, are still being explored really actively. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you and hope that you have a good day.